Well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, this is not my first presentation on the crisis. Um, when I checked my older presentations, I found that, I, I think it was in April 2010, I gave a talk on the Greece crisis before it had fully broken out. So uh, this essentially builds on the other one. Um, of course, you know that this is based on a quote by our Chancellor Merkel. And uh, before uh, starting, I'll give you my outline. I will start with some quotes, indeed some older ones and some more recent ones. Um, then we contrast the quotes with the reality and then uh, we will discuss the progress we have made so far with European economic integration but also integration as a whole. It's a little bit more than just an economics talk uh, because you cannot separate this from history and historical events, so that's past dependencies. Um, then uh, what in my view went wrong with the Euro, uh, uh, also some remarks on the failure of current rescue policies. Of course some would say without them everything would be even worse but uh, that's kind of factual. We see they are bad enough actually. Then of course the question for alternatives and then some kind of epilogue uh, with two scenarios um, of what I think might be the future of the Eurozone and uh, um, we will see. It's 2020 so write me an email if I was right or wrong <laughs> or if you beg to differ by then. Um, so let's start with the quotes. Um, Martin Feldstein is an American economist and uh, he has always been a Euro skeptic and uh, this quote is from 1992 and uh, it looks a bit visionary uh, with the benefit of hindsight, of course. So monetary union is not needed to achieve the advantages of a free trade zone. On the contrary, an artificially contrived economic and monetary union might actually reduce the volume of trade among the member countries and would almost certainly increase the average level um, of unemployment over time. Uh, moreover, although monetary union in Europe would uh, uh, almost certainly accelerate the formation of a federalist political union among its members, those countries that are not part of the monetary union would be political outsiders. The consequences of this for the future peace and stability of Europe, while difficult to contemplate with any certainty, may well be unfavorable. 1992, from an economist. And uh, Helmut Kohl in the parliamentary meeting which led to the adoption of the euro by the German Bundestag said our decision today on the euro introduction is also a decision on war and peace in Europe. So war and peace are always the hot topics behind everything we discuss. Uh, we will see whether this is a reasonable argument. I'm not buying this and I'm very skeptical here. I'll give you some examples uh, but anyway. Now for the more recent quotes and uh, let's take a look at Feldstein again 2011. Um, the creation of the euro should now be recognized recognized as an experiment that has led to the sovereign debt crisis in several countries, the fragile condition of major European banks, the high levels of unemployment and the large trade deficits that now exist in most Eurozone countries. The emergence of these problems was just a dozen years after the start of the Euro in, in 1999, was not an accident uh, or the result of bureaucratic mismanagement, but the inevitable consequence of imposing a single currency on a very heterogeneous group of countries. A heterogeneity that includes not only economic structures but also fiscal traditions and social attitudes. <laughs> if the euro fails, Europe fails. That's Mr. Merkel. And uh, Hollande, he tried to catch up with this quote, I guess. The euro is irreversible. Okay, so this is basically uh, some opinions on this economic and political ones. Um, well, if you take a look at reality, uh, it is fair to say that the European Union as a whole, not even the Eurozone, is in its deepest crisis ever, deepest economic crisis ever, maybe also political crisis. Um, you see that a more, uh, a larger number of countries, and the number seems to increase every other month, uh, is now basically close to sovereign debt default, so seeking money, you know, the pigs, acronym, you know, Cyprus, you know, Slovenia. I could also uh, add some more who are, which are on the verge. Some people are already talking about France approaching this stage. We will see that. We can also say that the massive rescue packages in different forms have not been really successful. I said this before um, because they didn't address the underlying causes. Uh, monetary policy can only buy you time. This is what every central banker will tell you, but it cannot uh, help 
policymakers not to do their job of improving competitiveness and local structures. But time we have bought, the question is, will local policymakers make the most of the time to address these issues? And uh, what is most troubling and the most um, obvious indicator, of course, unemployment, especially uh, juvenile unemployment, youth unemployment, up to 50% in Spain and Greece. But it's, if you take a look at the PIX countries, it's around about 30% on average. So a whole generation might indeed be deprived of a good personal uh, life except for maybe migration, we will see. But um, the longer the crisis lasts, uh, the more this unemployment will become structural and uh, people will indeed be in deep trouble over time. Uh, but it should also not be overlooked that there has been a massive political fallout as a result of the crisis. At least 11 governments were voted out of office during the time of the crisis, not always as a result of the crisis, but it should be considered to be a main contributing factor. Uh, so the countries include Greece, of course, France, Portugal, Spain, and Finland. You have seen, and this is what you also mentioned, um, a certain rise of extremist parties left and right in some member states. Take a look at Greece, take a look at Finland, and so on. <clears throat> Then uh, the growing fear of German dominance uh, is also manifest in cartoons and newspapers and uh, also in some political statements. Um, I was recently in Russia and they asked me, are you trying to get a fourth Reich? <laughs> so I told them not really, but uh, they were still a bit skeptical about this. But you see the memories of war still linger on. And of course, uh, in many countries, uh, many member states, the political support, meaning the support by the people and by policymakers alike, for the European Union project seems to be dwindling quite a lot as a result of it. And what we can safely say, um, the European Union pretends to be a, a legalized decision-making process, and we could say, however, that technocratic decision-making a little bit undemocratic or on the edge of it, uh, has by and large replaced uh, democratic decision makings when it comes to the big rescue packages. And then, of course, there's a big uh, legal debate whether key provisions of the treaty have been ignored, suspended, or fully breached. I just mentioned the no bailout clause. And, uh, EU SSR, well, that's a term which is often used in German blogs by commentators on, uh, um, in, on comments on European Union policies uh, for being too centralist and so on and so on. So this is a term which was not there five years ago, or ten years ago uh, in the media. Um, let's just address the first argument, the war and peace argument. Euro uh, as a prerequisite for war and peace. This is so stupid. I cannot even understand why a historian like Cole uh, talked about this. Um, we have no historical evidence that a single currency or lack thereof has led to war. Uh, and I give you some historical uh, examples. The great American Civil War, they had a common currency and it didn't prevent this slaughter. Um, the gold standard did not prevent World War I. Uh, the rupee did not stand in the way of the separation of British India into Pakistan and later on Pakistan Bangladesh from India. So uh, that wasn't a problem. The ruble didn't stop the implosion of the Soviet Union. The dinar didn't prevent the war in Yugoslavia, the explosion on the Balkans from 1991 to 1999. Slovakia had the Karuna, nevertheless, we have uh, Czech, Czechoslovakia, we have Czech Republic and Slovakia. And, uh, in the Western world, there was no war despite having national currencies at all. So this argument we should fully ignore. To me, it's just nonsense. OK. Um, we also have to go back uh, to history a little bit. Uh, because the European Union is a hodgepodge of different political attitudes towards political union, economic union, uh, and preferences. Uh, um, regarding inflation, um, the role of government in society, and so on. Um, we will see that. What we can safely say before World War I, uh, what we'd call Europe um, was rather deeply integrated economically and politically. Um, the reason is simple, most of these countries had a long uh, tradition of being monarchies and everybody was interrelated. So there was a massive amount of free trade, foreign direct investment, and of course, unbelievably so in the world of Schengen and non-Schengen, we says uh, free 
movement of people. You didn't need a visa, you didn't need a passport. Um, take a look at Karl Marx. Karl Marx was born in Trier, in rheinland uh, He died in London. He just could move around freely uh, without a passport, and this was it. This was the reality of economic and political integration uh, before World War I ex uh, erupted. Um, when we take a look at the um, uh, aftermath of World War II, um, you saw the rise of two superpowers, the Soviet Union in the East and the United States in the West. And uh, the former great powers of Europe were a little bit um, diminished in size and political influence. So the real winners of the Second World War were the Soviet Union and the US and France and, and, and the UK were just, well, supporters. Uh, not politically, we always speak of four allies, but uh, in terms of size, in terms of political clout, France and the UK were really diminished in size and impact and influence. And uh, what we can rather safely say, uh, especially from the French and German side, both countries saw an enormous chance for uh, different reasons uh, with the creation of a Western European integration process. I will get back to that in a moment. What we can say, however, is that we still have massive differences, fundamental difference regarding the objectives, the scope, and the methods of European integration, including European economic integration. Um, to put things a little bit bluntly, some member states prefer a federation of rather independent sovereign states. Others prefer a full-fledged political union, a federalist structure. Um, in terms of the economic uh, uh, integration, some are happy enough with free trade or the single market of four basic freedoms. So that's the um, clear classic economics argument. We don't need a common currency for this to function as long as we keep the borders open for goods, services, capital, and uh, uh, people moving. Others say this is not enough. We need to dig deeper. We go uh, further. So we need a full-fledged economic and monetary union, a supranational uh, control, a supranational structure for all economic policy areas and for monetary policy as well. So this is basically uh, the setup. And uh, we shall see later that the uh, treaties reflect this and the structures of the European Union also reflect this. So what happened? Uh, this is what I already alluded to. Um, French ambition was to become a powerful player again after World War II uh, by being a member of a large European complex of countries. And for Germany, it was a unique opportunity after the war, which Germany had caused, uh, to become respected again in some way or to try to get respected again as a uh, civilized member. And don't as underestimate football here. So the uh, 1954 Football World Championship was won by Germany. And this was the first big event, international event, where Germany, West Germany, uh, was allowed to compete uh, after World War II. So it was a long process back and this was a unique chance politically to become integrated into the civilized political uh, complex. Again, um, today we call this deutsch französische Freundschaft, German-French friendship, or the German political, uh, German-French axis, the motor of the European integration. I said this in my class today. Um, uh, we, we hardly have any, or I would rather say we have no uh, uh, no case in the history of the European integration when there was a dissent between Germany and France and the project would never thus be put forward. So unless those two countries agree, something moves. If they disagree, nothing moves. Uh, it's a bit unfair with the others, but this is also uh, part of the history and part of the fact that Germany and France were the, single, the two largest economies starting the project, uh, excluding Italy, which was pretty much the same size as France. Okay, um, again, uh, most of you are not from Europe, and for this reason I would like to dig a little bit deeper here. Um, why is it so that the German-French relationship has been so special? Uh, you really have to go into history, and uh, even most Germans don't know this. And I remember I was in, 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 in Paris last year again. My, my girlfriend was never in Paris. I had to go there. I had to go to Versailles and so on. So yeah, I, I tried to skip this because I found castles boring and chateaus, but nevertheless, 
I had some insights, so uh, <laughs> at least. This. So um, we all know that there has been some kind of uh, hostile relationship. So the talk of Erbfeind, hereditary enemies, is what every German, every Frenchman, and every woman and German woman know. So a very strict, maybe just maybe the. Japan, Korea, or whatever, or Japan, China, maybe. So that's similar to that, similar, for the same historical reasons. Um, what is interesting, um, uh, you might not know this, but uh, uh, the Nazis called Nazi Germany the Third Reich. So there was a Second German Reich and the First Reich. So the Second German Reich was founded in Paris, in Paris, in the Chateau of Versailles, uh, in the Hall of Mirrors, Spiegelsaal. Uh, and I learned this when I walked through. <laughs> so I knew it was founded somewhere there, but not in this site. And uh, what is also interesting, if you walk across Versailles, Hall of Mirrors and so on, you see a lot of battle paintings commissioned by the French uh, emperors of the time. And I would say two thirds of the battles depict battles between German, Prussian, whatever, and French armies. So there is something to it which is really also psychologically relevant. Uh, what was the revenge here? Well. <laughs> The Treaty of Versailles is known to everybody, but it was also signed in the Hall of Mirrors. So this was basically the historic uh, revenge, so to say, for the first humiliation, and then again you had this one. So tit for tat in a way, and I was not so fully aware of the symbolism of this long Hall of Mirrors uh, until I saw this. So I thank my girlfriend again for taking me there. <laughs> but um, okay, so you have historical baggage. And this explains a lot, though not everything. Um, but it also means that in case of doubt, politics has taken precedence over economic considerations. Uh, and we see this clearly, especially in monetary integration. I, I had this in my class today, um, when we also discussed the history a little bit, but uh, those of you were not in my class. Uh, many projects of monetary integrations were not successful, and nevertheless, governments carried on. I will give you a few examples later on, and then uh, we will see that more clearly. But even if you go outside the monetary sphere uh, towards the general integration process, there have been successes and failures. So uh, early on, not everything worked. The defense community, the political community were not ratified by the French parliament. Um, it took a long time, until Maastricht that is, to get them under the European umbrella. Okay. Um, I would say that the most important event of the European, and I would rather say Western European integration process, until that time there was uh, no uh, member state of the former East, was the Treaty of Maastricht. Uh, for the reasons I mentioned here, um, we all speak of the acquis communautaire, that means all the rules must be uh, implemented by all member states. Uh, there were some, well, exemptions of uh, transitional periods and so on, but uh, the final result is clear, it must be the same body of law everywhere. And I would say, uh, as a non-lawyer, that Maastricht changed a lot of that. So uh, you had the opt-outs, uh, which allowed some member states not to pursue more economic integration under the European Union setting. You all know that the United Kingdom is not a member of the Eurozone. Some of you know that uh, Denmark is not a member of the Eurozone, they have opt-outs. And you all know that Sweden is not a member because they reserve the right to hold referenda first, even if they meet the requirements of the convergence criteria. And this is what they did, and this is what the Swedish population said no. So it's not any more same size for everyone, it's more a la carte, it's more, uh, um, well, a variable geography as some political science, just call it. And of course, this is not just the Eurozone. Uh, we have 17 member states out of 27, and that means currently we have 11 different currencies on the single market. And no one could argue that there is a trade restriction between, say, the UK or Sweden and the uh, Eurozone. In the past few years, uh, trade grew faster with non-Eurozone member states of the European Union than within the Eurozone itself. So uh, Feldstein on this was certainly not, uh, not perfectly wrong, saying that you don't need a common currency to promote economic growth. So 
the picture is rather mixed. Uh, and of course, Schengen is the other example. Not all member states are Schengen members. Uh, even some non-European Union members are Schengen members. So it's getting more and more like a la carte since we've had uh, ratified Maastricht. And this is what I had in my class today. I really like this. This shows you the whole uh, geography uh, or landscape of Europe. And if the question is, um, the Euro, will Europe fail? Um, I have always said the European Union doesn't fully represent Europe. So the Council of Europe is a more appropriate political um, approximation of Europe because almost all, uh, uh, Vatican is not included, of course, uh, but almost all European countries are member of the Council of the European Union. And uh, I also said this today, the most populous country in Europe is well, Russia, uh, with 125 Russians living west of the Ural. And uh, if you take a look at the other member states of the uh, Council of Europe, Turkey is also in Turkey, would rank third with more than 70 million people. So um, the European Union, this is what we can say, is not fully representative of the whole of Europe, of its diversity, um, of its culture, whatever. So it's a little bit of a hubris to say, the European Union represents Europe. I've always said this, and uh, of course, um, as more and more countries have joined, the claim becomes a little bit uh, better founded, but there is still some way to go to be uh, a perfect uh, representative of everything European. Okay, so far so good, so far so bad. Well, monetary integration and its sad history. Um, where shall we start? Um, there was a system of fixed exchange rates uh, available uh, on a global scale. Global in this case means in the Western economies uh, because most of the other countries were either in the communist bloc or colonies. So North America, uh, Japan and, and much of Europe, much of Europe. So we had a system of fixed exchange rate. It was called Bretton Woods system and it collapsed uh, over an extended period of time. So let's say between 68 and 73 when it was completely, um, well, imploding. It was not exploding. It was There was no noise. It was just imploding. And for those of you who, you who are not uh, old enough, um, at that time, uh, the German foreign exchange market in Frankfurt was shut down for four weeks until a new system was uh, arranged, four weeks. And that was 1973, then you had the oil crisis, so you had a lot of double whammy uh, shocks at that time, which was really massive. Um, however, under Bretton Woods, we saw frequent realignments. Realignment means that uh, the fixed exchange rate is not so fixed, it gets changed because the governments say, okay, we should make some adjustments. So there is always some degree of flexibility here. And uh, some weak currencies saw their, uh, uh, sorry, saw their currencies devaluated and some of the stronger economies saw their currencies revaluated. And in the following, it makes sense, it's helpful to take a look at, at the countries because uh, when I come to my epilogue, we will see we have by and large two sorts of countries in the European Union. Uh, and uh, uh, this might give rise to some further um, considerations. So typically, the lira, the peseta, the drachma, the French franc, and the British pound would weaken vis-a-vis -vis the pound, uh, sorry, the Swiss franc, and the German D-Mark over time, regularly. Um, France's franc was uh, losing. Uh, so much value against the D-Mark since the uh, Treaty of Rome was signed. So uh, the revaluation of the D-Mark vis-a-vis the pound was 300%. So if it was one for one, it would be three for one after just 45 years. So it was really a weak currency. Germans always looked at the Italian currency, at the lira to be a weak currency or the peseta, but the franc was not performing much, much better. Uh, so over an extended period of time. Um, what happened uh, when the end of Bretton Woods became rather visible on the horizon? Well, uh, the commission and the heads of state proposed a regional block of fixed exchange rates as a replacement. And uh, the uh, president of Luxembourg, Werner, prime minister, was uh, given the job to prepare a report, a design plan, the runner plan. Okay, so 
it failed in the chaos of the final years of uh, the Bretton Woods system and it was replaced by uh, um, a looser arrangement which is called currency snake. A snake is something that winds, you see, so there were some corridors, snake in the tunnel or snake without tunnel. Uh, the objective was always the same, to reduce the volatility of a system of flexible exchange rate which would otherwise have filled the void after Bretton Woods implosion. So the motivation was to carry on with the system of fixed exchange rate at the European Union, or sorry, the European Communities level was still ahead of the Union. So it's a makeshift system of fixed exchange rates. And the corridor, the bandwidth, the tolerable amplitude was plus minus 2.25%, so the full amplitude 4.5%. Um, it collapsed. It collapsed only a few years later. Okay, this was an exceptional situation with the Bretton Woods crisis and the oil crisis. But you saw a lot of currencies getting into the system or getting out of the system at that time. Um, and if you take a look, if you go to the final years, the final years, it was such a loose um, uh, construction that uh, only these countries remained in the system. And these are basically smaller economies which packed fix their ex currency exchange to the D mark. And uh, even France got out. So this is probably a group of countries, excluding France, which would have no problem with a monetary union among them. Um, then, of course, policymakers tried to fix the snake. And the result was called EMS, European Monetary System, or Exchange Rate Mechanism, which is the term mostly used in the Anglo-Saxon world, especially in Britain. And uh, it was joined by all EEC members, with the exception of the UK. They followed later in 1990, so the system carried on for a few years. And it was pretty similar to the old currency snake in terms of the corridor. Uh, but there was an exception for Italy, plus minus 6%, given an amplitude of 12%. Uh, acknowledging that the economy of Italy was a little bit less in sync with the economy of the uh, other member states. In the first years, you had at least, so historians differ here, at least 18 realignments, meaning the originally fixed exchanges were modified by devaluations and revaluations. Almost all the time, the D mark revaluated became more expensive, and almost all other currencies devaluated. And it is the same picture again. So the French franc devaluated, the uh, lira devaluated, and so on. Um, and then there was no more political consensus after 1986 to do so. So what they did instead, um, they tried to prevent devaluations, revaluations with uh, interest rate policies. So countries which are about to devaluate can try to prevent this by increasing their exchange rate, uh, their, their interest rates. This means capital flows inside, and this puts an upward pressure on the currency. That's the point. Um, but it's also fatal in some uh, situations. And this happened rather fast. 1992 is the key year. Uh, the event which was triggering uh, much of the Black Wednesday uh, episode that is further down was, of course, the German German reunification. At that time, uh, interest rates in Germany reached a very high level. So Germany had an, a small internal boom increased demand, while the rest of the world was in deep economic crisis. If you remember that time, 1991, uh, for Germans, the main event was, of course, uh, before this reunification, but it still was the aftermath. But you had the uh, Kuwait, Iraq war, the invasion, the liberation, and so on. So all prices went up, and much of the world economy was in, in a recession. And that means, typically, the appropriate monetary policy response is not to increase interest rates, but to lower them. So, And the French government was in recession, but they didn't want a devaluation of the French franc again. So they increased the interest rate of France pretty much to the German level of 9.01%. And this basically, over two years' time, cost one million French persons the job. So yeah, this is politics versus economics. Uh, the policy strategy was franc fort, a strong 
French currency. This was the political priority, and for this reason, they couldn't give in. Um, then you had September 1992, the de facto collapse of the EMS on Black Wednesday. You see, things happened very quickly. So first of all, on the 13th of September, Italy devalues the lira by well, 7%. The next day, the United Kingdom went out of the system. Uh, the day after, Italy went out of the system. And then the speculators, as they often refer to, uh, took a closer look at France, and they also argued they are overdue for another devaluation and speculate against the French currency. And uh, there was a Brussels compromise, and they didn't give up by name the EMS, so it still exists as EMS2, um, but uh, they changed the corridor from plus minus 2.25% as a regular case to plus minus 15%, which most economists would say is a system of rather flexible exchange rate rather than fixed ones. So the political decision was we cannot let it fail. And the economic compromise to make this happen was to basically give it up in its economics structure, but keeping the name of EMS as a system of fixed exchange rate. So uh, politics versus economics. Uh, in parallel, before the crisis, you see uh, the three, st three stages and so on uh, in the Delors plan for the implementation of the uh, monetary union, monetary and economic union, the convergence criteria in the treaties of Maastricht, and uh, then you see the council decision which member states of the then 12 member states should be admitted. Uh, so the results basically were that 11 out of 12 member states were fit enough to join for, by and large, meeting the convergence criteria in uh, the legal interpretation which the treaty provides for progress towards or convergence uh, towards the threshold levels, not full, uh, literal meeting the uh, threshold levels. Um, but if, as a hypothesis, uh, everybody would have uh, used the four convergence criteria literally, not as a convergence towards those criteria, just literally, not even Germany would have qualified. The reason is simple. Uh, the German government debt at that time was at 60.2%, moving up from 58%. So there was no convergence, but rather divergence. We were much closer to the 60% threshold than Belgium or Italy. But if it's convergence, you should get closer from a higher level and not closer from a lower level breaking through. And uh, on strict implementation, these countries would have qualified. France at that time, Luxembourg, Ireland, and Portugal. Uh, isn't that interesting? Yes. So some of the uh, pigs were better than the uh, more stable economies today. Very bizarre, very bizarre. And then, of course, Greek, Greece was also admitted politically after credibly demonstrating it. And then what you know uh, is when it became a legal tender um, and that we have the crisis which is going on. Um, some, some data here. This is basically the size of the Eurozone in terms of the um, GDP shares of its member states. It's just the Eurozone of the European Union. So you see the biggest economy in the Eurozone is Germany with a share in 2010 by 27.2%, uh, followed by France, 21%. Uh, this is uh, Italy with 16.1%, and then you have Spain. Um, interestingly enough, if you add the GDP of two pigs, Spain and Italy, their combined economy is larger than Germany's. And this is basically the problem. If Spain and Italy follow the path of Greece, uh, <laughs> yeah, okay, I don't have to say anything about this. Uh, this is quite obvious. Greece is here at 2.5%. So, okay, pick your country. And if, as we had speculation uh, two months ago, that France is also on the edge towards, well, we could not bail them out. It's impossible. Then everything will really collapse. Uh, at least the euro will not exist anymore. Okay, what went wrong with the euro? It would be wrong to, in my view, it would be wrong uh, to give a monocausal um, interpretation of what happened. There are a few different uh, effects. It's just like a mosaic. It's rather eclectic. And for this reason, any uh, solution or attempt to solve things which focuses on just one factor will not do the trick. Um, it might be worth to remember that if you have a monetary union, 
which is the extreme case of a system of fixed exchanges, you lose two policy instruments. You lose monetary policy. This is what everybody knows. The uh, interest rates are set by the European Central Bank, just like they are set by the Federal Reserve in for the US and in the US. But you do not lose just this policy. You also lose the exchange policy. Uh, that means you lose control over the external value of your currency. You cannot devalue or revalue to regain competitiveness. So uh, what Italy has done uh, repeatedly with every um, cost push inflation they had due to the Scala Mobile thing, what is Scala Mobile? Well, uh, there was a guaranteed um, compensation for workers uh, in form of a pay increase to the tune of the inflation rate. So inflation would go up 5%, wages would automatically increase by 5%. So kind of cost push inflation. and. Uh, Externally, they compensated for this by devaluing the lira versus the other currencies. So it was basically the offsetting effect. Um, and if you take away the exchange of policy because you give up your currency and merge into another one, you cannot devalue your way out of this problem. That's the point. Then you have to stop cost push inflation, which is what we call austerity. <laughs> and this is basically a real devaluation uh, as opposed to a currency devaluation. So this is where it really hurts. So um, economists will argue that there is no problem here if. If members of a monetary union or a system of fixed exchange are economically similar, move in sync. And we call this optimum currency area theories. And uh, that means they can do away with national uh, monetary policies, because the economics, uh, the economies are really so similar. They are all in boom or in depression or recession at the same time, and the monetary policy response would be the same everywhere, and no problem here. However, if there is a boom in one part of the region and a depression in another one, a recession, it doesn't work. You have to decide, as a monetary policy authority, will you try to stop the boom or will you try to prevent the depression. So it's a different interest rate response. It would be higher interest rates in the boom area and lower interest rates in the uh, recession area, depression area, but you cannot do this if you have just one authority. That's the price you pay. Um, it was called coronation theory by many German economists who said that the European Union is not ripe for monetary union because they argued in some um, pamphlets, manifestos, uh, they are not uh, optimum currency area. And this was called coronation theory. You should fully integrate in the single market, try to harmonize uh, policies first before you set up the crown of a joint currency, coronation theory. Um, others argued this is correct, but, and the but was called pacemaker theory. They were aware that there are economic differences between economies and productivity in whatever. But the argument was the common currency will kick them in the, hmm, to make, make up their minds and mend their business. So pacemaker theory means the rigidity of a single currency would push forward much needed reforms to make those economies more competitive, more productive anymore. We can safely say today that this was wrong. It didn't work. So, but this was the argument. And uh, we still have it today. Uh, okay. So that's my list of factors which are the root causes of the problem. And I just see the euro as some kind of amplifier. I don't see it as a primary cause, uh, just as an amplifier, with one exception. Uh, I will show you later on some graphs. Okay. So we're clearly not an optimum currency area, and we're unlikely to be one anytime soon because of these reasons. We have extremely low labor mobility. Only about 2.5% of all Europeans live and work in another member state. So of course, if you just go to the bigger cities, you meet more. But uh, on average, there is little integration. We have low capital mobility. We have very low price and wage flexibility in either direction. Flexibility just doesn't mean downward. It means upward or downward. Uh, we have heterogeneous economies. Take a look at the production patterns and specialization, uh, productivity levels, business cycles, and of course, tolerance 
of inflation, preferences for inflation. They're different. In some countries you accept more, in other countries you get hysterical about more. <laughs> That's exactly the point. Uh, we have no cross-border risk-sharing fiscal transfer system. You have something like that in the US uh, in a different um, shape than what we have in Germany, for example. But this is what you have there. And I would say, but this is open to debate, I don't see any European spirit. Um, uh, Ten years ago, when I was younger, if you were to meet someone else uh, abroad, in the European face, and that person would say, I'm European, you would, could with a 100% chance say he or she is from Germany. Only Germans would say that. If you meet someone from Spain, I'm Spanish. If you see someone from us, I'm French, and so on. So this was really it. And uh, I, we don't have a European press. Do you read Portuguese newspapers, if you're not Portuguese? Do you read Spanish newspapers? Some do with some speak language, but there is no European press, there is uh, no European identity, and so on, and so on. Um, maybe it grows over time, but that's different from the US. They say, I'm from Michigan, but I'm American. So, and this is really, has grown over many, many years, uh, also on the ruins of monstrous wars, civil war there, that uh, were just not there. Okay, um, before the Euro, we could see this heterogeneity. We could see this, uh, and it was reflected in one very nice economic indicator, which is interest rates. And uh, they reflected country-specific inflation risks, inflation expectations, and country-specific productivity differences. I will show you on a graph what I mean. Um, and of course, um, we had the euro now, and it created an illusion, an illusion of economic convergence and heterogeneity. What do I mean? If you take a look, and this is for Germany only, these are the uh, interest rates for German government bonds. What is interesting is, first of all, the scale here. Just take a look at this. The maximum was almost 11%. And uh, this is the time frame, 1975. Um, what you see here, is the reunification peak of 9.01%. Uh, uh, at that time, I invested all my money in German government bonds. It was perfectly risk-free <laughs> at that time it was. Uh, but you see a downward trend, okay? You clearly see a downward trend. But what is important, um, this is where the euro kicks gradually in. Uh, you see a rather high average interest rate even for Germany, rather high compared to what we have today. I give you another slide, another extreme, not Greece. It is interesting. Uh, this is from uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of Feder uh, St. Louis. They have almost all countries in the world, but not Greece. <laughs> um, I found them in a different uh, database, but I wanted to uh, standardize things a little bit, so I took Spain instead. Uh, please take a look at the scale. It doesn't stop at 11, it stops at 20%. 20%. And um, again, this is where the euro kicks in, but before this, if you stop here, you might see an average of 12.5%. And uh, what really made me angry um, about Greece uh, in the first uh, rescue package, they argued, well, we will not pay 7% for our government bonds. And Germany paid 9% and so on. And Greece, I will show you later on another scale, uh, paid much, much more than 7% in the past. So. People seem to be short on memory sometimes. It was only 20 years, 30 years ago that all these countries, including Germany, but the others as well, had to pay much higher interest rates than they pay today. Okay, let's take things together. Uh, one more, sorry. This is the productivity score for Eurozone member states. What you see is that Germany is not the most productive economy. It's not. Um, it's only number four. Finland is the benchmark. Um, well, uh, the blue column shows you the productivity levels, average levels, that is, uh, regarding uh, the uh, European, you know, the Eurozone average. So the average is there. Finland is clearly above it. The blue one shows you the percentage uh, of Germany's productivity. And then, then Germany is 100, so you see Austria slightly ahead, the Netherlands slightly ahead, and Finland a little bit more ahead. And finally, if you take a look at the yellow column, you see the countries 
productivity with Finland as the benchmark. So Finland stands at 100 and they're all less. So pick the countries and you also see clearly that uh, there is a productivity differential, the one I mentioned. Again, Germany is not the role model here. Uh, the German economy is not perfect, not really. Uh, okay, what is this? <laughs> okay, we... This is 2013, so almost there, so it's rather fresh. 2000, 1991, and this is 1993. And these are the interest rates countries had to pay for their government bonds. And uh, the gray one is Greece. So going down, going down, going down, and going up to previous levels. Um, and this is what I refer to as the illusion of convergence. So you have very, very similar interest rates at a very low level after the euro was introduced. And this has had massive economic repercussions, massive, of course, massive problems. I will get back to this in a nutshell. But what, if, if, I, if you allow to, me to put it bluntly, what we see is a back to normal. As I said, these interest rate differentials reflect different productivity and different inflation rates. And we're just back to where we were. So this is my illusion of convergence that many people believe so. The reason now and the challenge for economists is to explain it. And there are competing explanations. I will give you some. Uh, one of the, and this is where you basically start here with the explanations. There were basically two schools of thought. Um, some people believed the pacemaker theory. So they gave some credit to those countries and they argued the euro is there, it will kick in, and then of course they will become more competitive. So it was basically um, some kind of um, bonus for future performance uh, in terms of improving competitiveness and the like. This was the idea. Uh, others believed that the no bailout clause would not hold and that in case of doubt, the northern economies, especially Germany, would bail out the southern economies uh, if things were to go wrong. I have no opinion on this. Uh, make it up for yourself. But these are the most important and basically the only explanations for this trend. So, um, what we can also say, after the euro was introduced, Germany was the segment of Europe. Germany was the sick man of Europe with very low growth. Um, how do you know that everybody believes you're the sick man? Just take a look at The Economist and the cover uh, of The Economist. Uh, every few years you have a different sick man, which is a discrimination. There is no sick woman here, but it's always the sick man of Europe. Now, at that time, it was Germany. And what did Germany do? Well, this is what the Germans know as uh, Hartz IV Reform Agenda 2010. Basically, a small dose of austerity, uh, and it was nothing else. And it, in some way, re-established Germany's competitiveness, and this is essentially what some other countries are up to. Ireland is doing very uh, much here, much, much more than Germany did, but this is basically what we as economists would call austerity or internal real devaluation. If you cannot uh, reduce your interest, uh, sorry, if you cannot reduce your uh, interest rate to create unemployment. If you cannot devalue your currency to create uh, employment, then you can only lower wages or entitlements. You can have to devalue something, and these are the three well, uh, alternatives. There's not much more. But what is more important, um, you had negative real interest rates in some of the PICS countries. What is a negative interest rate? Well, you have inflation and you have the interest rate you pay. Um, and if the inflation rate is higher than the interest rate you pay for a credit, the value, the real value, inflation corrected value of your debt decreases. So basically, negative interest rates are a subsidy for debt. <laughs> you subsidize, and it's very rational, you are stupid economically if you do not take on debt in this situation, because over time, uh, inflation eats away your debt levels. That's the point. And for Germany, we had positive, very positive, real inflation rate. And then you can see what happened in those countries, which we now call pigs. You had an investment boom, property boom, consumption boom in those countries. You saw Spain building uh, real estate, property, Portugal pretty much the same. You saw Ireland uh, 
taken off economically with also large infrastructure investment booms. Greece, will they just uh, have a good life, obviously. <laughs> and uh, Italy, well, it was, I wouldn't think Italy is a pig. I have much, much more trust in Italy than in, in most other member states. Italy is rather robust and stable uh, in terms of their debt levels, so um, I wouldn't call them pigs. Anyway, um, they should be more surprising. But you can see by this one reason why we have seen those booms in those countries which went bust when the interest rate went up again because much of the loans could not be repaid at the higher interest rates. That's the point. That's pretty much the point. If we summarize, um, uh, we have different combinations of problems in the so-called PICS countries. Um, if we start with Greek, uh, we have excessive public debt, we have an uncompetitive economy. We have zombie banks, uh, meaning banks which are technically bankrupt, but they are kept alive. Um, and a resistance to structural reform, which predated the crisis and which still to some degree exists. OK, uh, the measures that were adopted by various Greece governments are very tough, and they are much stricter than what we did on the agenda 2020, uh, 2010. But nevertheless, it takes some time until they kick in, and probably voters there will not tolerate much more or even that. So this is the well, situation of Greece by and large. Spain, Portugal, different. Um, you have a burst real estate bubble, which you didn't have so much in Greece. You also have some zombie banks, just think of what happened recently. You have an uncompetitive economy in some parts, but it's doing better because you still have some manufacturing here and also some resistance to structural reform over time. Um, but what you don't have here is excessive public debt, at least not in Spain. In Spain, the debt level, the public debt level is lower than Germany's, and it has been for a long time. So it's a different combination. They have a higher private debt levels. For this reason, the bank under pressure, higher private debt levels because many Spanish people invested in property at the low rates and cannot repay. That's, uh, from an economic perspective, it's the same whether it's public debt or private debt. Uh, but again, Ireland, same thing, real burst, uh, real estate bubble burst, high public debt, but only after they had to bail out their biggest banks. So basically what we saw in Ireland was a conversion of private sector, financial sector debt into public debt through the bailouts, small country, large banks. Switzerland only narrowly avoided this fate. Um, that's also uh, another interest. Switzerland would also be an ask. Italy, excessive public debt, but stable. Excessive means 120% for a long time. So they're very good debt managers. That's what we can say. Uh, a slowly declining competitiveness and also resistance to such reforms, uh, same as France. And that is, again, the foreplay before the crisis. Uh, and now we have piled up uh, a lot of problems and pent up demand for structural reforms in all countries. That's the point. But nevertheless, the causes are not identical. How about Germany? Some people say Germany is benefiting a lot, yes. But it's also only artificial. Um, this is the German trade surplus in billion euros. And you see it crept up slowly, uh, which most economists would say is not a good thing anyway. Um, a trade surplus is not a good thing at all because um, somebody has to pay for the products you export and if countries go bankrupt they cannot pay and then you didn't export but you gave away for free. Um, this might be the final result. But when the euro was launched you see a massive increase uh, both in terms of the level and the speed of the increase and uh, this is where we stand now, uh, slightly going down, but uh, again, it's an unsound development. The deficits of other member states are partly reflected by the surpluses of Germany, Austria, and so on. So we're all in the same boat. Uh, and uh, if you talk about fundamental imbalances, it's not just the deficits, it's also the surpluses, okay? So what's next? Um, just the pigs again. And this chart I found rather interesting. Watch out, it's not in euros, it is in US dollars because it's from a US source. Um, these are different countries and uh, the question is, the banks which are registered in those countries, how much exposure do they have to the PICS countries? And uh, this is the exposure by and large. And that means Australian banks, for example, have only lent 
0.1% of their loans to the PIX countries, okay? If you go down to Portugal, Portuguese banks, obviously because Portugal is also a PIX, have lent 14.1% to the PIX countries. Uh, this is the total exposure in US dollars, in billions of US dollars. So it's 3,231 billion US dollars. Uh, so that's round about 2,500 billion euros, which is Germany's GDP. Okay, and this is the size of these countries' banking sectors. Uh, you would be surprised maybe, take a look at the United States and Germany. The size of the banking sector is pretty much the same. The US doesn't have a very large banking sector. <laughs> they have a huge capital market, and this is where the investment banks go, and this is where uh, investment banks are not really banks. Basically, they issue bonds and stocks for companies, a handling agent, and then they do the speculation. That's all right, but they are not merchant banks or commercial banks. And, and this is what we don't have, uh, because we are a very banking-oriented uh, um, economy in much of Europe. If you want a loan, you go to a bank. As a company, you also go to your house bank. House bank. In the US, you go to the stock exchange or issue bonds. And for this, you need investment banks and not uh, commercial banks or Sparkassens. They didn't do it. So it was a division of labor. Uh, okay. So let's dig deeper here. What's the exposure to individual PIX countries by banks, say, from Germany? Uh, okay. You follow Germany. Maybe I go to the other side. Germany, uh, at the time this was compiled, 47 billion US dollars, 38 billion euros to Portugal, Portuguese banks, to Ireland, 184, because many German banks are in Ireland, so much of this is also internal, and uh, to Italy, 190 billion, so that's 150 billion euros, uh, Greece, only 45 billion dollars, so why 700 million billion in, in, in EMS? And uh, the big one is um, Spain with 238 billion dollars, around about 180 billion euros. Uh, but these sums are manageable. They are not so high. And uh, what is also interesting, if you take a look at France, you see a lot of exposure by French banks. Um, Ireland has some exposure, and the United Kingdom also has some large exposure. But again, those sums are manageable. Um, what we have in the ESM and other rescue packages is much, 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 much more than the exposure to the banks in those things. So basically what this is about, what would happen to German banks, what would happen to French banks if Greece were to go bust, uh, if Portugal were to go bust, how much would they have to write off? Uh, a bank bailout, and this are basically the numbers. I, I did not use European Union numbers because the US ones are more accurate. So this chart is about one and a half years old, so they're slightly higher now, but still manageable. The alternatives. Um, the alternatives. I would say that the monetary union has massively contributed to the current problems. It has not caused many of them, it has contributed. Um, what would have happened without the monetary union? Contrafactual evidence. Well, the interest rates would be substantially higher for many countries. This is what I call back to normal on, on the last chart. Um, and as a result, there would have hardly been the excessive debt levels that we see now. There would have hardly been the big booms we have seen in the roaring 19, late 1990s because at that time, debt would have been much, much more costly to take on. So the low interest rates subsidized taking debt. Without that, with higher interest rates, less debt, less uh, pronounced booms, and so on. Um, what we would have also seen without the euro, even under a system of fixed exchange rate, probably some revaluations of the weaker, uh, of the stronger economies and some devaluations of the weaker economies, just like we had under the EMS in the first years. And this might have helped them to regain, maintain their competitiveness. But again, in the monetary union, you cannot do this. You cannot do that. <laughs> That's the point. And uh, also, revaluations would have reduced the excessive trade surpluses, say, in Germany, Austria. They are just excessive uh, by all economic standards. Okay, this is a quick one on the policy reactions. I think we can flip through this uh, fast. You know the figures. Um, 
we have quantitative easing, uh, you have very, very low interest rates, then the question is whether the purchases of bonds were legal or illegal, so I'll leave that to lawyers. And you saw the ESM, uh, mm. the European Stability Mechanism, which is currently at 700 billion uh, euros uh, as a lending ceiling and so on. So, you all know this, we can skip through this. Um, among the proposed measures, we have those, Eurobonds. A Eurobond would basically be a single government bond uh, for all of the Eurozone. And this means those countries which uh, now face high interest rates would see their effective interest rates go down. And those countries which currently face low interest rates, like Germany, would see theirs go up. So basically a subsidy of those more competitive economies to the less economy, less competitive economies through the interest rate mechanism. Uh, you have the fiscal compact, which is assess, uh, essentially version number two of the failed stability and growth pact. It failed for one reason. It was uh, proposed by Germany. Uh, it was a request by Germany to impose it uh, as a, <laughs> a sign of mistrust against especially uh, Italy. Uh, what is the stability and growth pact? Well, you have the deficit criteria of the treaty um, as one of the convergence criteria. And that uh, stability and growth pact uh, makes them permanent. So excessive deficit procedure is the buzzword. You are not allowed at all to have a higher government deficit than 60% or a current deficit in your budget in excess of 3%. So one criterion was uh, made permanent. It was first breached by Germany, France and Portugal. And uh, because the Council of Ministers has to invoke the penalties, there was agreement that, well, we should not punish anyone. So for this reason, it was dead law, it failed. And the fiscal compact has uh, some other um, sanctions. Uh, one would include uh, suspension of payments from the European Union's budget to those member states. But the structure is rather similar. So I might expect in case uh, of a showdown, it would also not be fully enforced. So that's the lesson of history. I would be surprised, and I'd love to be surprised if things were different next time, but mm, I have some doubts. Banking union is part joint banking supervision, uh, but also uh, joining in the extreme version of the proposal, uh, national deposit insurance schemes, which are more generous in Germany and the uh, Netherlands and so on than in other countries. So this would also be a transfer under the assumption that German banks are more robust than banks in other member states. So there are more defaults abroad, then that would be a transfer. If there is the same uh, default rate in Italy, Spain, Germany, then there is no transfer. Uh, but this is an assumption we just don't know. And finally, fiscal union institutionalized and unconditional fiscal transfers from rich to poor member states. Um, yeah, this is basically, in a nutshell, what is on the list. Did, Fiscal union we have, we call this Länderfinanzausgleich in Germany. <laughs> so this is, again, the German model of uh, what happens. Okay. I still believe it would not work because uh, I mentioned the big problems before and I don't think they address the big problems. Um, buying time is one thing, but solving these problems is another. Um, we have uh, uh, probably a much too large banking sector because the banking industry has historically been the most subsidized sector of the economy because of this implicit guarantee. Too big to fail means uh, government pays for your default, they will keep you alive. So you take on risks, you grow farther. Uh, and this is a worldwide phenomenon. Most countries would not let their banks fail. For this reason, the banking sector is always too big in, in economies. Um, the labor market is rigid in many economies, you have a lot of corruption. Red tape and entrepreneurship are often at odds. Inefficient state and enterprise. Unsustainable welfare states, meaning entitlements are higher than productivity levels, which can never work in the very long run. And which is one of the reasons why we have so much government debt in many economies. And inefficient tax system. Um, half a year there was uh, an interview with the chief taxation officer of Greece in one of uh, German's uh, large newspapers. I believe it was either Die Welt or uh, Süddeutsche. I don't remember exactly. And he said, well, if all our taxes were actually collected, uh, government revenues in Greece would increase by 40 to 50 billion euros a year. And this would solve all their 
debt problems. To remember, uh, to remind you, the debt level when Greece went through the haircut, the haircut um, was 350 billion euros. And if you earn 50 billion or 40 billion more, this is manageable, you can really pay back, but they don't do. So what we actually do, if we bail out Greece banks, uh, Greece's banks, we subsidize tax evasion, which we crack down on massively in Germany. So we support that there, we build it out, and we just, this is not cynical, but uh, anyway. Okay, um, what should be done? I still have some more slides, but also some graphs, so give me 10 more minutes. Um, what we see is basically a redistribution problem. Who pays the bill? There are problems, and who pays for the problems? Uh, we should also make sure, uh, or make clear one thing. Um, those countries who are at excessive debt levels, well, it was mostly their citizens who benefited from those excessive debt levels. I lived in Bremen for a long time. Bremen is also excessively in debt, and it's a very nice place to live because it's partly other people's money. It's not popular to say this in Bremen, but let's be honest, in a way. Uh, uh, I come from Bavaria, which was subsidized a long time to get to this standard of living as well, so we also borrowed money from other uh, richer parts of Germany attribution thing. But we also have the subsidiarity principle in the treaty. I mean, uh, I think it would be nice to fill it with life, and i give you two slides to show you exactly what I mean with filling this with lives. The reason is, in most of the PIX countries, the net wealth of private households as a percentage of GDP is much higher than in Germany. So they have more private sector wealth than Germany has. And again, what you could also do is increase taxes, improve tax collection, and address two generous welfare states. Um, in some countries, you get retired 50, 55. Russia is the same. Okay, that's nice, but somebody has to pay for this. You on your own through savings or the welfare system, so that's the working population's money. Uh, however, voters will probably kick you out if you do these measures. That's the problem. Okay. This is from Deutsche Bank research, they should know. Um, this is for 2000, 2005, and 2011, the amount of private households, financial, and real estate assets, um, including liabilities, that means private sector debt. It's not companies, just households. So this is Germany, DE, okay, it's not the English abbreviation, but okay. So you see, um, at this time, if you exclude the debt, uh, we had private sector wealth to the tune of 3.5 times Germany's GDP, so 350%. But if you subtract uh, the um, liabilities, loans that they had taken on, especially for real estate, uh, that would probably be uh, 2.7, uh, roundabout, 2.7, a multiple of 2.7. Uh, in Spain at that time, it was 480 with lower debt levels. In France, it was uh, 380, slightly higher than Germany's, but lower debt levels. And for Italy, it was the highest. And then you clearly see, uh, because the dark gray is the real estate, you see the real estate boom in, France, uh, in, in Spain and its impact on wealth. And uh, this is where we stood at the end of 2011. And uh, still Germany has the lowest multiple of private household wealth compared to some of the crisis state. So um, in Germany we talk about uh, new taxes on private property, Vermögensabgabe, and so on. Well, these countries could do the same. So it's getting better. Uh, there's also gold around, banking union. Uh, gold reserves, the gold bar price is high, you could use your gold reserves also to repay your debt, okay? Part. Of course, if you flood the market, the price will go down, but this is the same area. So this is the total amount in tons of gold by the largest owners of gold. And what you here have, uh, what you have here on the last uh, in the last column is the share of gold in that country's or that institution's or complete um, external reserves. So 
uh, foreign currency and gold, okay? And you see the US has in absolute and relative terms uh, the highest amount uh, and share. Second is Germany with 3,400 tons. That's what we assume, we don't know where they are. <laughs> there has been a debate, there's a search, do they still exist? Because much uh, is stored in New York, London, and overseas, not in Germany. Uh, the reason is simple, Cold War period, and everybody was afraid that the Russians would march in and steal the gold also. Uh, so they were taken away to the Western Allies, some is also in France, and so on. But we had a political debate, is the gold still there? <laughs> okay. Uh, and the share is also high. Number three is the IMF. So Germany controls more gold reserves than the IMF. Uh, but take a look at Italy and France. Uh, they are also large holders of gold reserves. China is a distant uh, sixth. And what is amazing about China, China doesn't seem to believe in gold. So you believe in US treasury bills, which are just paper. So, uh, and for this reason, of course, what the Chinese government is doing, trying to invest in companies worldwide, as, as good as gold. And this is exactly the point. <laughs> it's just paper. So, Russia, the same, but they don't care. They have other natural resources uh, and so on. So you see the list. So there is some money around in some of the countries which are crisis countries. If you just take a look, the, the European Union's top 13 members, so I, I stopped counting here with Finland. Uh, Portugal also has massive amounts compared to its size and so on. Um, I highlighted the UK, Sweden and Denmark because they're not part of the Eurozone, of course, but this is also assets that could be used to address some of the debt problems, okay? Epilogue, finally, lastly. Um, we said this, it's not necessary. Uh, if it works, it's okay. If there is an optimum currency or area over edging towards it, it's okay, it's no problem. Uh, but uh, I probably don't see this for the time being. Um, my hypothesis would be in this current configuration, the costs of the Eurozone are greater than the benefits from the Euro. And uh, what was also interesting for me as an economist way back into time, uh, there once was a report by the European Commission. It was about the single market. It was the Cecchini report. Uh, the older ones among you might remember this. And it was entitled, The Benefits of uh, the costs of non-Europe. As an economist, all we do is cost-benefit analysis. So the full title, the full analysis should have read, cost and benefits of non-Europe. And this is typical of the European Union's institutions. They always highlight the costs which could be saved by further integration, but they do not highlight the costs that might occur as a result of deeper integration. And if you remember the Euro introduction, the main argument was that people will not have to exchange money at borders, will not have to pay commissions anymore. And the example I remember this was some guy traveling across all European Union borders from the then 12 member states and started with 100 D-Mark at the time and being left with around about 40 D-Mark at the end of his journey just because of commission fees. So these are clear advantages. We save this money, but uh, the rescue package is the price we pay. And currently it is uh, obviously a mismatch uh, for most. Um, what I also don't see is a monetary union of 27 member states, let alone 17 in the current configuration. Um, I also believe that the euro will politically survive. It will not fail in this sense. It will not be given up. The Americans believe that. Um, I was attending the annual meeting of the American Economic Association in San Diego last weekend, and there was a nice roundtable debate. You had Martin Feldstein on the podium on the one hand, and on, you had Robert Mundell, the inventor of the theory of optimum currency areas, and then you had someone from France, Jean-Claude Trichet. <laughs> So, and they all had their statements on, on this, and it was extremely interesting. I will tell you what Trichet said when I saw the problems. I don't have this on these slides, they were finished before I came here, but he said we made six big mistakes. And uh, uh, some are more important than others, but they were quite interesting. Um, okay, so they will do anything they can do, and I see some similarities with the EMS crisis in 1992. So the EMS was kept by name, although it was no more uh, a system of fixed exchange rates, just one of flexible. So, but politically, it will not be dead. I have two scenarios on offer. There might be many more, but 
let's see. Uh, a shrinking eurozone, and this is what we refer to as Grexit or Spexit in the case of Spain, whatever, whatever. Or the German exit, the German might also uh, leave. Yeah, <laughs> Gary exit, or <laughs> something like that. Okay, there is one big problem. It will not work per se, because the debt those countries hold is in euros. And that means if they get out and they will have their new national currencies, these currencies will lose a lot of value with the euro. But since their debt is denominated in euro, the real burden they have to repay is higher. So this would break their necks. If we have a problem now, then this would finally break their necks. So the repayment burden in euros would increase as expressed in their new national currencies. So an exit alone will not help them at all. Okay. So it must be accompanied either by a haircut or by fiscal transfers from the other member states. So this is the only way. Um, we had a haircut. We had a haircut for Greece. Um, I don't know if you remember this. Uh, it was executed last year. And uh, it reduced Greece's uh, official debt from th uh, by 107 billion euros down from uh, 350. So it was a massive debt, but it was mostly affecting private sector bondholders. The European Central Bank was exempt uh, with a nice uh, technical trick. They also hold a lot of held a lot of Greek government bonds, and they were issued just a few days before this uh, haircut a new series with new numbers. So they exchanged their stock of bonds, got new numbers, and those new bonds were exempt from the haircut. So if you're a private investor, you're always last in line. This is one lesson you should always remember in every currency crisis, or you are last in line. The banks will be served before you, other countries will be served before you, you are always last in line. So I don't have any government bonds anymore, <laughs> for a long time, by the way. Scenario two. And this was proposed recently also in, in, in Germany uh, by um, uh, some, some, some lobbyists. But the idea is old. It was floated in the early 1990s by some German economists. Uh, they argued, we really don't have uh, an optimum currency area, but we have basically two groups of countries which could form a currency area of their own. And then would be linked with either fixed or flexible exchange. So this is the Euro North, Euro South. And if you go back to history, if you see the currency snake, there was a group of countries which performed very well, and you saw other countries would always get out. And those dropouts could also move pretty much in parallel with the Euro South. But this must include France. And this is going to be the problem. It will never include France, so <laughs> for political reasons. Uh, but this might be one of the uh, other realistic scenarios. And um, what I don't believe is that we will see fiscal transfers, uh, a fiscal union, the style we have it in Germany, because the amounts of money we talk about would be so large, um, it would not work politically in Germany at all. So that's uh, basically what I see. But again, you still see the devaluation, and you have the same problems here for the euro cells. Also additional help, maybe temporary, but maybe haircut. So you probably cannot get away with a haircut. Sorry for being a little bit over time, uh, but thank you for your patience and your attention.